Hi, everybody. Um, uh, with the screen, do we advance the slide or do you switch? Great, thank you very much. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Corey Habecker. I'm with Holst Architecture. I'm a principal and sustainability director. Hi, everyone. I'm Maggie Harris, and I'm a project manager with Holst Architecture. Um, I'm also uh, working on my PhD in urban studies, focusing on the intersection between housing and health. Um, we're really excited you were able to join us here today. It feels a little weird holding this microphone, so I apologize if I if it's like too loud or too quiet. Like raise your hand. Um, I haven't done this before. Um, so uh, we're here to, to talk to you about post-occupancy evaluations in new affordable housing. Um, if you're not familiar, post-occupancy evaluations or uh, POEs, um, sometimes we'll say for short, are really just an evaluation of the building after people are occupying the building. Um, we have, uh, as we're going through this, we were advised by resident services coordinator for the building we were studying not to call them that to the residents because it sounds like maybe they're getting evicted and then we don't get to do a survey in advance. Um, but that's not the case at all. It's really just a way to evaluate a building that's been in operation for a little while. And it's something that's not commonly done and this was our first. So really this presentation is about the story of how we developed this process um, implementation on one project, which is in progress, we're not complete yet. We'll have a little bit of results from that survey to share with you, but really this is about like what we did and how we did it and uh, what we learned from it. Um, so I'm gonna try, Ooh, yeah, great. Um, so just as a way of background about Holst Architecture, um, we're a 50 plus person firm uh, operating in Portland for the last 30 years. Um, we had done quite a lot of multifamily uh, market rate work, but I would say in the last 10 to 12 years, a lot of that focus has shifted to affordable housing, affordable housing with services included. Um, we have uh, seven ground up projects and I think six renovations completed for, uh, which include about 860 units total. Um, and right now we have, to my surprise, we have 11 projects in various phases of design and construction, um, which are, you know, constitute well over a thousand additional units. Um, over the last uh, five to seven years, Holst has gone through a lot of changes and done a lot of sort of introspective work about how we work as a firm and the kinds of work we're doing and made a lot of improvements internally. Um, coming out of the pandemic, we went through a strategic planning um, initiative. And one of the imperatives we came out of that with is uh, more to be more serious about looking at our work, both in the design phase and looking back at our work after it's completed with a sort of data mindset, looking at like actual um, results. And part of that is to complete the post-occupancy evaluation and to, to make that a thing that we do more regularly. It's not commonly done in architecture. Um, for us, the margins are thin and time is short. And so looking back at a building that's already done and nobody's complaining about is a little hard to justify and owners don't wanna pay for it. So it's something that we really took upon ourselves to do um, pro bono, just so that we can learn from successes and failures in a project. Um, so I think, yeah, um, before we get into the actual POE, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of Holst's design um, values, because I think it, we use those to directly inform the kinds of things we were looking at. Uh, when we conducted our post-occupancy evaluation, evaluations. Maggie will talk about this later, but there's all kinds of different ways you can look at a building, like very quantitative or qualitative, and we took more of a qualitative approach. Um, so our design principles listed here, and I can barely see this, um, uh, worth and value. Um, you know, we strongly believe that all of the occupants and residents of the building um, have inherent dig dignity and the buildings should reflect that and support that. Um, and none of these are really controversial. I just wanted to kind of get those out there on the table. Um, community connection. I think architecture has the power and architects have the responsibility to make spaces that build or provide a foundation for the for development of strong communities. Um, creating activated and welcoming spaces, certainly everybody will get behind that. Um, housing is healthcare is an interesting one. Um, it's known that you know people with housing instability and people who are chronically unhoused um, suffer more greatly from a variety of health maladies. Um, and whether it's 
because they have health issues that they're, you know, have housing instability or vice versa because of our messed up system and how people are accessing healthcare um, is a little bit of a chicken and egg thing. But what is known is when people secure stable housing, their health outcomes improve. So um, it's important that we get people in housing. Um, inclusive design is really kind of, is really related to um, uh, worth and value and community connection, which is, you know, regardless of your background, um, you are worthy of good housing and uh, you're worthy of a dignified place to live. Trauma-informed design is the last one. And for that, I have an additional slide. So kind of bonus slide. Um, so it's something that uh, we became very much aware of working on a drug and alcohol treatment center, which was completed uh, a year or two ago, um, that certain populations have, you know, have experienced trauma in the past, are particularly sensitive to kind of their surroundings um, and aggravation of that trauma. And as that relates to affordable housing, um, it's becoming more and more important because the populations that we're trying to house are more and more compromised. Um, the advent of incorporating permanent supportive housing, um, you know, kind of makes that even more uh, important. Um, so the principles of uh, trauma-informed design being safety, both uh, actual and perceived safety, um, nature, which is, you know, visual connections and access to fresh air, um, has all sorts of physiological benefits for building occupants. Um, comfort is obviously something everybody wants and it undergirds all of, all of this. Um, uh, coherency, <laughs> can't even read that. Um, coherency is all about um, having spaces that are easy to navigate and visually coherent, not a lot of clutter, um, understandable spaces that kind of keep you calm because you're, you're not like struggling to make your way through the space, um, which relates to de-escalation, um, which is uh, kind of about, you know, um, if you are aggravated or you're feeling like elevated stress levels, providing spaces that are calming through like the use of color or texture, or just simply giving people a chance to like get away. There's like an alcove you can go and just chill out in and just get away from the, the hustle and bustle. Um, those are all really important, uh, which also kind of is linked to the last one, which is empowerment. Um, empowerment's about, all about giving occupants agency over their surroundings, giving them the ability to rearrange the furniture or open a window or change the lighting levels or control the temperature. All of those things can kind of like help stabilize and, and uh, settle people. Um, I think with that, then I'm going to hand it over to Maggie uh, to get into kind of the, the bulk of what we did. All right, great, thanks. Um, all right, so knowing that the principles that Corey just went over guide our uh, multifamily design process, um, really what we want to do in the study is to gather insights into whether the actual res resident experience uh, aligned with our intent. Um, so we, we looked at all the principles that Corey just discussed and distilled them down to three primary themes, which are health, well-being, and connection. Um, so it's through these themes that our post-occupancy data took shape. Uh, we want to note that for the purposes of the study, we've defined health as the indoor environmental quality that might affect a resident's physical health. Uh, well-being is referring to how the building might be affecting a resident's mental state uh, by influencing the stressors in their daily lives. Um, and lastly, connection takes into account the building's accessibility, both from a physical and social perspective. All right, uh, since our research predominantly focuses on um, the resident experience through the health lens, uh, I wanted to build upon what Corey had mentioned previously and share some background on the greater research on housing and health. Uh, so research demonstrates that housing stability and health stability go hand in hand. Uh, substandard housing can expose people to a wide range of health and safety risks. Uh, cost burden households um, are often challenged with affording healthcare necessities, and frequent moves tend to have a negative health um, implication for children specifically, um, as well as prevent individuals from building support networks. Because of this, housing is a well established social determinant of health. 
We also want to note that since we uh, were the architect of record on the project that we would be studying, we were eager to hear any and all feedback from the residents. Um, however, it was important to keep our research objective and research problem at top of mind. Um, so this is from a concept board exercise that we conducted with our full office um, to generate questions for the resident surveys and focus groups. As you can see, there's a lot of ideas um, those are kind of the sticky notes sprinkled on the screen to the left. Um, and uh, we really need to, to narrow down and again, um, have it relate to our ultimate research problem. Um, and then that in turn would, would translate to a clear research guide for the study. A bit about the research methods. Um, so for this study, we aren't collecting numerical data points um, on the resident's health or building performance. Uh, that is our goal for it to come later. For now, our study is primarily qualitative, um, and that's focusing on the understanding the hows and whys behind the resident's experiences in the building. So with that being said, here's our predominantly qualitative methods that we use uh, to evaluate our themes, which are health, well-being, and connection, and then the criteria, criteria that we're looking at within those themes. Um, so we conducted survey questionnaires and, um, with residents, and we'll do future focus groups. Uh, we also conducted interviews with building staff, um, and then we, uh, our team also uh, did photo observations and field notes uh, um, as well, uh, accompanied by the building staff uh, through the building. Uh, there's also demographic data that we're gathering um, in partnership uh, with REACH uh, to support and understand the uh, resident population in the building. And this is just an overview of what I went over. So first step was identifying the research problem and objective. Next is collecting all of the data. And with that, it's establishing the site, so the building and the sampling criteria, which is the building users. Um, and then we do the data analysis and in the end, um, take everything that we found and compile into a final report that we would share with uh, the project team, client team, and hopefully the larger uh, architecture and housing industry as a whole. All right. Uh, so a little bit of information about the, the building that we studied. Um, the project's name is 72 Foster, which appropriately is on the corner of 72nd and Foster Road in Southeast Portland. Um, why did we pick this project? Um, it is recently built. Uh, it's been occupied for more than four years now, um, but not too old. So sort of in our recent memory, we the people who worked on it are still around and can understand why we made decisions. So I think that was kind of an influencing factor. Um, if we looked at a project that was ancient and nobody remembered why we did anything, it's harder to learn uh, lessons from that. Um, the other, I think, important point was that the, the owner, Reach Community Development, was really enthusiastic about when we approached them about doing this, um, which is really critical. And we'll explain a little bit more why, why but um, it's not an insignificant commitment of their time to this. You know, we weren't charging or anything like that, but it requires dedicated staff time from there, from them to, you know, communicate with us, to sit down for interviews, to walk us through the building, to help us communicate with residents. So their enthusiasm was really, um, really was helpful. A um, couple of project images, just to kind of give you a sense of the building. Uh, the image on the left is uh, the, the Northwest corner, uh, Foster Road's on the left. There's some retail spaces on Foster. Um, the upper right image is the building lobby where you can see the mail, the entrance, um, and the spaces kind of on the left are uh, resident services. And the bottom right image is a um, community room for the resident's use. And hopefully you can see this well enough. It's a little bit light, but this is the floor, ground floor plan. Um, north is sort of to the upper left. Foster Road's across the top um, horizontally. 72nd is on the right, uh, like a diagonal. Um, the retail spaces are lined up along Foster Road, and then there's a retail space facing 72nd as well. Directly across the street on 72nd is the Mercado, um, which is kind of a, a, a hub of a fixture of the community. To the lower right, 
or to the lower left, I'm sorry, um, is uh, a cul-de-sac, which is um, Raymond Court. Um, and that had been used historically by the neighborhood as sort of an outdoor community space. Uh, it's a dead end. So, you know, kids would play out there and things would be, things would be happening there. And so it was imperative on the design team not to ruin what they had. Um, so there's uh, on-site parking, both tuck under and surface, um, which, you know, like first impressions is you might have driveway access off of that cul-de-sac, but to preserve what they had going there, drive, uh, vehicular access is off of 71st and 72nd. And then really what we did was um, use, like kind of built upon that existing community space by providing a pl public plaza that just expanded what was happening in the, in the cul-de-sac. Um, the other key thing about this is the connector through sort of diagonally to the, where the Mercado is um, that connected that public outdoor space inside of you know, the, the crook of the L of the building to the Mercado. There's a visual connection, a physical connection. You can walk between them. Um, the, other, the only other thing to note, I think would be the, the and this will come up a little bit as results in our research. There's a stair. Does this have a pointer? Ah, oh, it does. Oh, that's not, it's not strong enough. All right, so I'll try to verbally describe this. There's a stair along Foster Road, sort of in the middle of the elevation there. And then another one on the lower right-hand corner um, which I will advance the slide so you can see where those fall upstairs. So this is a typical, this is actually the fourth floor, which is a little different than the other floors, but this is the gist of all the, the, the other floors. So it's, I, I neglected to mention, it's a concrete podium on the ground floor with retail. And then up above is three floors of wood framed housing, 101 units total. Um, so double loaded corridor, you can see the stair kind of falls uh, uh, where that, along the top of the drawing where there's a, a jog. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, it's a bit away from the, that, that, that end elevation. Um, so essentially, you know, stairs at either end of the corridor. The elevator is lined up with a lobby, which is at the crook of the L. Um, there's a pair of elevators. On the fourth floor, there is a lounge space and a balcony space. Um, so I think uh, the only other thing to mention would be kind of the unit mix, which is pretty heavy on two and three bedrooms, um, which was uh, imperative for reach. They were really interested in having a very intergenerational community with lots of um, be able to accommodate larger families. Um, so one of the, I did want to talk a little bit about who we were able to engage with through our surveys our questionnaires rather. Um, and uh, as Maggie mentioned, the plan is to do focus groups with some of the people who participated in the questionnaires, but that hasn't happened yet. But in terms of the people that we were able to get responses from a pretty wide variety of age, ethnicity, and gender, um, we're working on getting the actual demographic built information for the building to see how representative this is, but it does feel pretty representative. Um, and then in terms of, uh, yeah, some other demographic information about people, whether, you know, they need mobility equipment or not, uh, their occupation and how long they've lived there. And I think the third one, how long they've lived there is really pretty key. We've got good participation from people who have been there quite a long time. Some 28% of the uh, respondents actually have been there essentially since the building opened. Um, so a lot of experience there. Um, the other thing that we did, um, again, sort of a qualitative data was interview REACH staff. And this is where I was talking about how REACH's enthusiasm and participation was so critical. Um, they gave a lot of their time, actually, um, the community manager, the resident services coordinator, and the building maintenance uh, individuals, uh, all people who have dedicated time in the building, um, but also gave us a lot of their time and walked us through things. Um, and I think the thing, you know, we got a lot, a lot from that. Um, the thing that was really, uh, I think, interesting about those interviews were where they were able to kind of illuminate and um, build upon survey data. So um, I think that it really helps with our depth of understanding of the survey results. And I expect that when we conduct the focus groups that'll further amplify that, that kind of synergy. Okay, next, data analysis. All right, so a bit about the data analysis, and we're still in the process of analyzing the data, uh, but we want to give uh, kind of a, a glimpse of what we're finding so far. Um, so 
This has never been seen before, data. <laughs> Uh, so the first one falls under a theme of health, um, and the question uh, for this was, how do you rate your comfort in both your unit and the common areas? Um, and so we started to try to tease out the res residents' uh, perception of the indoor environmental quality within the different building spaces. Um, what we found interesting at, um, with this particular set of results is that you'll notice that um, the majority of the feedback for the units versus the common areas are very aligned. Um, what stands out is that there's some orange, which is the worst um, in the temperature for the units. Um, and that's because there's central AC in the community spaces, um, but not in the units. Um, so each multiple choice question like that, um, that I just showed was accompanied by a short answer opportunity for the residents to share additional thoughts. Um, and so these are some quotes that we pulled from those short answers and really help us uh, start to understand the why behind their feedback. Uh, so the next question relates to the theme of well-being. Um, and for well-being, we centered a lot of the questions around safety, since safety is a primary stressor in many people's lives. Um, for the areas where the residents had the lowest confidence in safety, we found it was due to high theft and incidents um, around the exterior of the building. Um, and unfortunately, these incidents, um, as I'm sure we're all aware, are not isolated to only 72 foster. Um, so what we found is that the residents' perception of safety reflects the trend of increased issues that many multifamily buildings are experiencing throughout Portland. Um, and this feedback, um, although we're all um, aware in the back of our minds, it really opened up our eyes as designers um, to making security and the feeling of security and safety for the residents in our buildings um, a forefront of our design priorities. The question was the degree of safety experienced in the fourth floor lounge and balcony are in the 50 to 54% range, which is surprisingly low, you know, to me. Um, I, I'm, I'm with Reach, we're the owner and operator of the building. Um, and so wondered if you got any more specific feedback on that. Uh, as far as I know, we don't have specific feedback uh, because we would have to get that from the written inputs. And I don't recall seeing anything like that. This is something that we need to follow up with in the focus groups and kind of ask follow-up questions to find out why. I know there were, and we have a slide that covers this, but there were reports of people kind of behaving badly with the furniture on the balcony. Um, so it could be related to that. Anything else to add there? Uh, no, I think you covered it. All right, and for the last theme, um, we looked at uh, the residents' sense of connection to each other. Um, so we asked how often they socialize with their fellow residents and the community and the building staff. So here's a snapshot of that data. Um, and then, Um, we also just asked a simple question about what areas in the building each resident uses. Um, and so questions like these would really be beneficial to elaborate on, um, in our focus groups and for residents to explain firsthand, um, any barriers that they may have, um, or that may be preventing them in using the spaces. One hundred percent of people use their unit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we, like as um, Maggie was saying, and, and I was saying, we did do walkthroughs with building staff and took some uh, observations and uh, took some photos. Um, these are sort of representative of that. And a lot of this, um, I think we do have good feedback on, but some of this, uh, I think are 
candidates for further study via focus groups or quantitative quantitative data taking. So the first two slides are really about that that um, break in and theft issue that they've been struggling with. And again, it's it seems to be endemic across the city now, where you know people are just looking for any opportunity they can to break in and either sleep or steal or. Um, it's not really specific to reach or this building or the neighborhood. It's just happening everywhere. Um, so I think that's food for thought for us in terms of how we can make the buildings more secure. But also, you know, in a design sense, you don't like creating a bunker looking building is not something anybody wants. So we try to find a balance there. Um, the third image uh, from the left is uh, right outside the main lobby entry. Uh, there's a built in bench there. Um, it's right at the intersection of Foster Road and 72nd at the corner there. Um, in the design process, we envisioned that as a place for people to like sit and wait for a ride or sit to let, you know, as their friend came downstairs to let them into the building. Um, and it sounds like that's not really used that way. And uh, so I'm curious as to why there's a comment there about it not being visible, um, but it's, you know, it's pretty, it's right there at the corner. So um, I was wondering if that's related to visibility from the inside or the outside or you know what, we just want to follow up on that. Um, and then the, the, the fourth image over was something we heard quite a lot, which was, um, as I mentioned before, when we were showing the floor plans, the stairs are at the ends of the building and not uh, coming down to the lobby. And uh, th the way that reach operates the building for security purposes, everybody comes in through the lobby. They can leave through the stairs, but they come th in through the lobby, which we provided um, two elevators for redundancy purposes. Um, and thinking that they would be reliable enough, but off, it sounds like it's pretty frequent that both elevators are down for one reason or another. Um, and if that's the case and people are coming into the lobby, they don't really have a way to get upstairs, which is a significant problem, um, more so than we ever uh, imagined to be the case. And you know, obviously the reason not to provide a third stair, there's good reasons to do that. Um, you know, the cost of a third stair and the loss of units upstairs and, you know, um, compromised uh, amenities upstairs. Um, but, you know, something, a lesson learned there definitely in terms of access to the upstairs. Um, these are images of floors two through four. Um, the one on the left is the carpeted corridor, um, which I'm always a fan of. I think it makes it feel much more, um, less affordable housing and more, you know, market rate housing, it feels like an amenity. Um, but because, uh, and I don't know if I pointed it out, but the where the trash pickup happens is at the far end of the building. So some people have to carry their trash quite far to the trash room and, you know, things get dropped, things get spilled, it happens. Um, and it's creating some staining issues on the carpet, which, you know, something I wouldn't have anticipated. Um, so the lesson learned there is to provide more resilient flooring um, and that's for situations so there's not so much of a cleanliness issue. Um, the middle image is of that fourth floor lounge and balcony, um, which mentioned was underutilized. Um, I talked to one individual at one of our in-person survey events um, that um, they kind of just forget it's up there um, because they live on the second floor. So that could be a reason it's underutilized. Um, so in the future, like, is there a way that we can, you know, provide that amenity? I mean, you know, being on the fourth floor was intentional to maximize views. There's a view of Mount Hood out of that window. Um, is there a way to do that in such a way that it can encourages people to use it more and not feel, doesn't feel so remote? Um, and then the third image over is really uh, talking about the, the heat issue that Maggie was mentioning. Um, this was developed in a time before it was kind of imperative that air conditioning be provided before we knew about heat domes and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, now it's uh, becoming, you know, REACH has made it a policy that they're providing air conditioning now. Um, but this was done before that. So there's air conditioning in the common spaces on the ground floor and in the corridors, but not in the units themselves. They have uh, ports to go into the windows so that the residents can provide their own air conditioning and connect to that system. Um, but not everybody has that. Not everybody can afford that. Um, and REACH does a really good job of, you know, particularly with people who might be compromised health-wise, checking in on them and making sure they're okay when it's hot. And also I'm just like encouraging them to keep their tenant, like their, their unit door open and draw in the cool air from the corridor. Um, but definitely a lesson learned about the importance of air conditioning throughout buildings these days, um, particularly as things continue to get more and more hot. 
All right, lessons learned, reflections. Um, this is uh, the schedule that Maggie put together of the whole process. Um, and it looks really uh, intimidating. Uh, <laughs> uh, but essentially uh, we spent five, six months kind of developing and, and, and going through this. We're not done yet. As I mentioned, we still have focus groups to conduct and then to put together the survey. And I looked at our um, kind of our um, timesheet software and did, did you get a chance to look again and reestimate? Stick, okay, yeah. So it took us a hundred hours to put this together, but that was like building the rocket ship on the launch pad and then launching it. Um, I think subsequent uh, surveys, uh, subsequent post-occupancy evaluations of this kind, if we do the same kind again, the qualitative versus quantitative kind, um, would be much less, probably half if that, um, because we've kind of got the framework in place. We have some understanding now of how we did it. We learned some lessons. Um, I think, you know, subsequent POEs, we probably look for new ways to do things, um, more efficient ways to do things, but really it was a non insignificant amount of our time. And there were, um, and the Maggie will talk about this too, but there were financial outlays as well in terms of, um, providing, gift cards for survey respondents and meals and things like that um, to kind of compensate for them for their time, which was not, you know, not a huge amount of money, but there was something there. Um, the second lesson was the importance of communication. I'm gonna check my notes and make sure I don't miss any components of this. Um, we did um, both online surveys and in-person surveys. Um, we did it via QR codes, we did it via digital newsletter, we did it via paper flyers taped to doors and taped in the lobby. Um, really tried to maximize the reach of our um, you know, communication with the tenants. And again, it was really critical that reach was participant in that they were able to um, let us know like the kinds of languages spoken in the building so we could provide, you'll see like the QR codes across the bottom of that. So that was like a flyer we printed out Oh yeah, go ahead. Sure, well, we got 25 responses. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, the, the question was, thank you. Um, the question was, can you give us a breakdown of how many respondents we got and um, the methodology in which they responded in terms of like paper versus online? Well, we got 25 responses out of the 101 units um, it was by unit, um, which we feel really great about. Do you call like the breakdown? Of in person. 13 in person, the remainder um, digital. Um, the reason we provided different means is that, you know, there's quite a lot of, you know, there's a huge range of people there. Some are comfortable doing things online, some are not. Some are comfortable with QR codes, some are not. Um, so it was important to have options for people. We also were at a unrelated events, uh, volunteering, and we're talking to, you know, residents coming to the events about the survey and trying to get them, get them to participate. Um, so really just try to break down all the barriers to participation that we could. Yes. Yeah, the question uh, was, um, how do we balance communication with the residents about asking for feedback with the understanding that things can't really change? Does that characterize it? Um, you know, that, Maggie, I'm curious to hear what you think about that, but it was really, people were eager to let us know what they thought did and didn't work because we pitched it like, we're the architects, we wanna learn from this building and we want to do better in the future. So we didn't really ever promise like we're going to change things here. It was really about like how can we do better for people in your situation in the in the future. Uh, yeah, I would say that that is a challenge. Um, asking for folks' times to help contribute to um, changes that they'd want to see that they're actually not necessarily going to see in their own building. Um, but I, um, I'll also note that in our surveys that. Uh, we did via Google form that we sent out on the landing page, there's an explanation of the study and our purposes for it. And so as Corey said, we did mention that this is to apply lessons learned to future buildings. 
Um, I think the last thing I wanted to say about communication was the importance of having an ally in the building owner. We wouldn't have been able to do this without Reach's like participation and their generosity with their time. Particularly, um, I think that's Peggy in that photo. Peggy Wolfert, who's the resident services coordinator. She really helped us quite a lot with communicating with the residents. She knows, I think, everybody there by name um, and was able to like advise us on the best language to use. She's the one who said, don't call it a post-occupancy evaluation because it's gonna sound scary to people, call it a building survey um, and gave us a lot of advice in that way. And she uh, helped with the translations and all that sort of thing. So having um, a good ally in the building was really critical. Yeah, uh, perfect timing. So uh, yeah, compensation. So we tried to follow the institutional review board guidelines for fair compensation. Um, and so that's just based on, there's really no hard and fast rules for compensation on what's right. It's just based on the particular population, the research activity that you're asking them to participate in um, and the time commitment. So um, for, um, so we offered gift cards for any of the survey participants. Um, and then for the in-person survey night that we held, um, we also offered a uh, dinner. And this came from, um, we, you know, we were kind of like, well, if we're doing gift cards, do you need to provide dinner? And um, Peggy, who Corey was just uh, referencing, said something along the lines of, you must acknowledge that you're coming into someone's home and asking them to help you do something. Uh, so if you hold an event at night at their home, make sure to offer them dinner for them and their families. Um, so that was really good perspective and advice to keep in mind. Um, and then for uh, the consent, um, we, at the beginning of the survey forms, uh, we asked everybody to, um, acknowledge that they're 18 years and older and understand that the data would be collected, um, in the study and distributed. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is through a Google form, um, that worked quite well for tracking all the data. And then we also ensure that um, everybody's names and unit numbers or any identifying data what, um, that we collected was discarded um, from any of our data tracking spreadsheets or archives. All right, so um, as we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, uh, our our study so far has been very uh, qualitative focused. Um, so our end goal in this is to synthesize both the qualitative data with quantitative data in the future. Um, but we first started with the quality of data because we wanted to understand the resident perceptions and use that as our basis to further our investigation um, into the resident responses and the actual building performance itself. Um, Last lesson learned. Yeah, so now what? Um, well, as Maggie mentioned, I think there's uh, potential follow-ups. Um, I think the one, you know, the, the safety issues, um, the heat issue, actually, I'm curious about like what side of the building are there particular units that are especially bad? Um, so there's, I think maybe follow-ups there after the focus groups, um, but how do we use this? How do we, you know, as Holst, if we're going to continue to do these, how do we how do we make it uh, make it worth our while? And I think this has already been pretty illuminating to having been through the design process on seventy two Foster, and we're now working for another building nearby uh, with Reach, and we've already kind of corrected course corrected a lot of things, uh, fortunately. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's helping me realize the value of some of the changes that we've made in this future building and all subsequent buildings having seen the results from this, this survey. So I think, you know, we have a very iterative process both within the design where we kind of like, you know, listen, design, present an idea to folks and get feedback and, you know, circle in on, you know, getting better and better uh, and more and more um, appropriate and useful for the, the building. So the, within that dark orange circle at the top, there's this iterative process. But I think 
overall as a firm, we can, you know, we complete a building, we do an a, a evaluation, we learn from it that can feed into the next project um, and feed into development of project requirements that are informed by past successes or past failures. And we just keep getting better and better each time. So I think that may be the conclusion. Yes. Questions? Yes. So in your last diagram, um, I think this is typically how, as designers, we've seen post-occupancy work, that we look forward to the next project. And I'm curious, now that you've taken the sort of idea of doing post-occupancy surveys and you're synthesizing a report, do you have any plans on sharing this information from a policy and legislative making effort? And I, I bring that up because of the, the thermal comfort item, because actually, historically, like the issue has been financing, right? Like that developers can't afford it. And um, in the past years, we've seen OHCS change their policies, and then it really became a requirement. And that's really when we start seeing it. But then you also see additional financing opportunities and funding opportunities to support that. And so I do think that as designers, I, I think you had mentioned this earlier, like there is a limitation to what we're able to achieve and respond to, and that at some point it becomes policy and legislation. And I am just curious if, since you are formally doing a report, if there's any plans for that. Thank you for your question. Um, we hadn't really discussed that. I think that's really powerful. I believe that not only has OHCS changed the rules, I think the state has mandated it starting next year that they're either air conditioning or some means for which tenants can provide their own air conditioning. Um, but yeah, I think if we haven't really discussed that, but um, now that we have some actual data about a project that doesn't have it and how it's impacted the residents, I think it's really valuable to share. We'll be looking for that. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. I really think it's really valuable. Um, I did want to point out for those on the ground and property management, asset management, um, I found it really useful to bring my development team through my most problematic property with the maintenance manager. Um, they know the items that are going to break, that you can't just replace a light bulb, you have to replace the entire microwave, things like that. So um, I think it's definitely useful for us to do on the ground too, not just rely on your architect to do it. I don't think there was a question there. I think it's a good statement though. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, did you pilot the survey beforehand or have there been any modifications to the survey just due to what you found is like a lack of clarity from the residents on certain topics that you might have in the future explained differently? Uh, yeah, so we haven't made any modifications for the survey that we distributed uh, because we wanted to keep it, it all consistent. Um, so uh, I think now is a great opportunity now that we're looking at everybody's responses to make those changes for future POEs. Um, but I'll also add that when looking at the survey, we previewed it before publishing um, and just the order of it and the graphic components of it. And so just making sure that there weren't a ton of multi, uh, multiple choice questions next to each other or you know, at the end having people seem like they're writing an essay. And we found that um, things as simple as the order really matter and help people um, uh, fill out the survey. Um, I did want to add that one of my curious curiosities in the focus groups is to ask about the survey and see if people had particular trouble with it. I think because we didn't dry run it on somebody um, outside the office, we don't quite know yet. Um, you know, if a particular question didn't get a lot of responses, is it because of the way it was worded or is getting towards the end? You know, those sorts of things I think are going to be interesting to, to find out about. I'm curious about the survey, um, when developing the survey content and structure, as you were just describing, did you collaborate with the owner on that portion of developing the survey? 
Yeah, we did. Uh, <laughs> uh, we invited the, um, the reach team to the concept board that I shared for when um, we we're working on generating the survey questions and focus group questions. Um, we also um, provided the QR code links for the survey to the resident services coordinator beforehand so she could preview it. Um, and I think it will, uh, Peggy's kind of the, in our mind's kind of the star of the show here, but um, just because her feedback was so invaluable. And so um, she provided feedback on the colors of the survey, the background, um, having a consistent kind of brand for all of our uh, materials that are going out from our flyers to our survey and just making it um, folks recognize that, oh, this is all a part of the same survey um, and team. Um, so yeah, although I think we had um, approached designing the survey or some of the materials from like the Holst brand perspective. And um, we, she gave really good feedback that like what people are actually looking for when reading these materials. Um, so like, we don't usually outline and bold, you know, uh, <laughs> our, our headers on our, um, on our flyers, but that's something that she said really makes a difference. So things like that was really, was really helpful. Reach had also conducted a survey of their own across all their properties just recently, like about the time we were planning to release our survey. So, you know, understanding that and understanding that it might create confusion amongst the tenants about what it exactly that we were asking, or if this was already the survey they did, um, we kind of delayed that. So we coordinated timing with them as well, quite a lot. That's perfect. That, my question was going to be about timing for, I guess, future ones that you'll do. Like, when do you think is the right time in the life cycle of the building. And I'm, I'm a contractor. So maybe with, I'm curious if maybe a good time could be, you know, we're already going to be in there doing our one-year warranty efforts. Is there, is there any kind of way that, you know, could work together through that one-year warranty period timeframe? Um, we hadn't really debriefed on that point yet. I think the one year does seem appropriate as long as Lisa is kind of happens and there's a lot of people there and they're using the building. Um, I think, it's, it would be nice to have them have been through a few seasons too, to kind of experience like last summer was pretty mild, um, subs earlier summers were not. Um, so if we have some, a mild winter and a mild summer, you might not get kind of the temperature feedback that you might otherwise get. So uh, do you have anything to add to that? I don't think it's a direct um, or directly related to your exact question, but I just wanted to note for the survey um, and focus group timing, that was also a consideration just in conducting the actual study. Um, so we, when talking with the um, REACH building staff, we had noted summer surveys and fall focus groups. And in our minds, I think, and when we put together that original schedule, it's like, okay, three weeks for the survey. And then right after that focus groups. And we, again, had to take a step back and realize that we're asking for people's time. And that's a big commitment to fill out a survey and then go right, you know, dedicate an evening to a focus group. And so um, you have to be strategic about that as well. Building on the focus group, uh, what size groups were you looking at? I know you had talked about in individual interviews or family interviews, but that then next stage of focus groups, are you limiting it to? Uh, yeah, um, for what I understand is best practices for focus groups is about five to 10 people per focus group. Um, and then ideally there would be three of those. Um, but once you get over uh, 10, um, it doesn't allow people an opportunity to, um, to provide their voice in the conversation. Uh, since you brought up and you're talking about the focus groups and all this afterwards, who are you bringing in on these conversations? Who's reviewing the status? Is it just you and your owner at Reach or are you bringing other people from the project team who were like, who went through the entire project with you? Are you guys all meeting back up as a whole now looking at the status um, to see what you did different? Or is it just kind of like a, what you guys are bringing together? 
Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, so far, it's really kind of just Maggie and I. <laughs> uh, we're still in progress. Um, I have shared it with some people on the project team within Holst um, because they were curious. Uh, we haven't really like fully digested everything um, into a report, but once that's complete, we're certainly going to share it with Reach um, and uh, probably make it available publicly as well, as long as we have their okay. Does that answer your question? I feel like I maybe missed part of it. Oh, well, that part. That's a Maggie question. Yeah, for the focus groups, um, it's really helpful if the, or and the only kind of requirement that we are setting for our parameter is that you have to have participated in the survey. Um, so other than that, other than being 18 years or older, an adult, um, and participate in the survey, any of the residents can participate in the focus groups. Um, it's great to get uh, within the fo focus groups, get a diverse group of individuals. Um, so different ages represented, different um, just a diverse group of identities. Um, but really, I would say the more participation, the better. So that's really the only parameters. I have another focus group related question. And that is when you actually talked about your five to 10 people in your three sessions, I was wondering if your thoughts are on organizing those three based on the three themes you had set for yourself in the study, or if they were really related to trying to reach out to more of those voices from the, I think, 25 participants that you mentioned having? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I'm not sure if we know the answer to that yet, um, but I think that there's a couple of ways you could go about it. You could be pretty prescriptive and taking um, the actual questions on the surveys and just um, going over those in the focus groups, or you can allow the group themselves to lead the conversation. Um, so more of a loose conversation focus group. Um, and I think that there's, I mean, pros and cons to both, um, but I like the idea of um, dividing by the theme as well. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I can speak to if there is an actual rule on that that you should follow. I actually was wondering if either or both of you were on the design team or not. I was. Yeah, I was wondering about, you know, just kind of related to objectivity and, you know, do you actually feel like um, you're able to ask really critical questions? Um, do you actually think it's a strength that you know all of the reasons? What are your, what are the pros and cons of, of having you involved or not? Yeah, and full transparency, I wasn't involved throughout the entire process, um, sort of early on, and I did some, uh, actually, analysis on overheating. Um, so it's kind of like, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and I was kind of tangentially involved in the stare question, so that kind of hurts a little bit. Um, I think that I personally got a lot out of more out of it than I would have had I not known the building. You know, like if I was asked to do something like this for another architect's building, you know, I, I think I would, I wouldn't know the right questions to ask. I wouldn't know a little bit more of the inside story of things. And so I think I'd be a little bit hindered in terms of, you know, poking around for information. Um, but Maggie was not involved. So I'm curious to see if she had a, has thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I think I could go either way. I think it's, um, really interesting if you are involved in the design process and then hearing firsthand the feedback about the design and the experience of the building. Um, but like Corey said, I wasn't involved in the design process. Um, I will say a challenge. I think you're kind of maybe uh, hinting at like any bias or influencing the participants. And um, I think it is a challenge that specifically in the interviews or focus groups when um, a resident or building staff is talking to you about something or issue you have, it's um, I think our nature to explain like why something is the way it is. And um, I think just holding back and letting the focus, you know, at the end of the day, all of the notes um, should be really from the participants, not from the researchers. 
I have maybe an interesting anecdote to add, um, and we, we might be at time, so this could be the last question, but um, I think I was guilty of doing that when we were to connect, because I was in the interview with Peggy, um, and she would say things like, actually, this is really interesting, which is, um, if you recall the plan, there was a dead end corridor on one end, and the residents who live on that dead end um, have a perceived sense of unsafety because they they recognize if there's a smoky fire in the corridor outside their unit, how do I get to the stair? Which is a fair question. The code allows it. The code says it's safe, but they feel unsafe. And I was like explaining to Peggy why it was safe and why we were permitted to do this. And so I think I was guilty of that quite a bit, but um, it's one of those things, like I'm curious to see if that comes up in the focus groups, but Maggie's like a scientist. And so she's really very particular about um, making sure that uh, our thoughts are not reflected in the results. Any other questions? So I'll just say I was involved in the design of the building as well. <laughs> Um, but one of the things that they said at the beginning was the strategic planning we did as an office. And um, we have a whole new crew of folks that have come into Holst that have energized us and questioned us and made us rethink our assumptions about what design is, who we're serving. And um, I got to say, I was, it was hard for me to hear that we were going to do this research. And I, you know, I don't like being questioned and I had a lot to do with, you know, all the decisions on all those projects up there. And I like to think that they were the perfect answer. And, um, but this new, this new generation that makes me feel very old, um, I think it gives me hope. It gives me hope that we're, we're willing to question ourselves and to improve. And so um, I just wanted to say that I hope that everybody that's doing affordable housing out there or community design um, takes that charge and really opens themselves up to being questioned and rethinking our assumptions about how things have to be. So I just wanted to thank Maggie for, for pushing us. You too, Corey. Thanks, Corey. Hi. Um, so, uh, being on the developer owner side, I find this incredibly helpful and I really appreciate it. And not only does it help inform like future projects, future buildings, but it also tells me where in our building, our, our partners might need support, right? Like our, our property managers or our resident service providers. And obviously there are some things that you can't change. You can't blow out a couple of units and put a stairwell in the lobby, but you can do certain things um, through partnership with those, you know, key on-site folks to activate different spaces, provide a better, you know, sense of safety, um, more of a sense of community. And so I'm wondering for you, if you see any benefit in sort of having property management and resident services play a little bit of a bigger role in the survey and focus groups and in a way that's not just you sort of um, interviewing them and getting their feedback, but also getting an idea of what can we do to improve this situation? You know, it would be great to understand if residents aren't using the fourth floor space, is property management doing anything to encourage that? Maybe they host an event, maybe they, you know, do whatever that may be. Um, but I'm just kind of interested to see if you think that would be beneficial at this time, or if you think, um, even though this is the qualitative side of things, if perhaps that is a, a separate from, from what you all are collecting. Um, I definitely think there's that possibility. They haven't seen these results yet. There's some people in this room with Rach who are seeing them for the first time. Um, but uh, I think once the survey is complete, we'll share it with them and have that conversation. There are things that came up actually from some of the building staff that weren't reflected in the results of the survey that I think we could work on with them to fix some noise issues um, that could be pretty easily resolved, but you know, the, the residents didn't complain about it. So maybe there's nothing that they need to do. Um, Maggie, did you have anything to add? Um, no, other than I think that would be a terrific goal and outcome of this. Um, but it is, it has been interesting to look at the um, interview data that we, um, from our interviews with the building staff and then comparing that to the data from the survey so far and not all of them relate or align. Um, and so, I mean, 
I would love to dig into that more um, and understand that. I think I think there's definitely an opportunity to do a follow-up interview and or focus group with just the building staff as well. This may dovetail with what you just mentioned, but I'm, I'm curious, it sounds like most of the the post-occupancy evaluation work that you did was kind of focused on larger themes and uh, resident experience, safety, comfort, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm wondering if through any of that process, you also got feedback on maybe more detailed things that are easier to change uh, or, or even just influence future design. So, you know, maybe something, uh, uh, I'm thinking from, you know, an asset management or, uh, or even a development lens of we should use this kind of carpet instead of that kind of flooring, or we should use this kind of countertop instead of that. I mean, I think those are some of the decisions that, that are a little bit more kind of project by project, easy to evolve, uh, or maybe as a, a maintenance or asset management lens to change out uh, when it needs to be replaced. And I'm curious if any of that feedback tended to come up uh, or if you were a little more higher level? Um, we did hear a little bit of that from the building mains folks. We also hear that, you know, we're, like I said, mentioned, we're working on a project with REACH right now nearby. Um, they're building maintenance folks and building um, asset managers are well aware of kind of what works and what doesn't. We didn't really hear that too much from the residents in terms of like, oh, my countertop is disintegrating. It was more about bigger picture stuff from them, um, but we did hear about it from building staff. Yeah, I'll just add, um, I think Corey shared a photo of the corridors and the carpet um, in the corridors. And I think uh, instead of one takeaway or one thing that would be fairly simple to adjust for future design is uh, is ca carpet necessary in the corridors or should it be LVT or a more durable material? And so there are some things like that. And I think once we dig into some of the responses, um, we can start to kind of break it down to, okay, what are these changes that can occur immediately or in the near future? And then what are some of these like bigger goals that we'll achieve with the overall design cycle? I am really curious that to do one for that next project when once it's built and occupied because a lot of things will be different about that one um, to do the same kind of questionnaire um, and find out how their responses differ. So like the, in that project, it is LVT in the corridor versus carpet. There were, I don't know if you recall, but there were some sound complaints uh, in 72 Foster, I think mostly related to sound between units, but I'm curious like, will a hard surface in the corridor result in more complaints about sound coming from the corridor kind of thing. So we'll find that out in five years, six years. <laughs> it's a slow process. I, I had a question just about the, the questions being asked of the residents, since it, it could almost be like a place for residents to kind of complain where they're also questions framed in a way that was kind of encouraging residents to be excited about their building or just from the owner's perspective, thinking about that survey. Um, yeah, it, uh, that is also a challenge. And it was um, an opportunity to hear some complaints, which is fine. Um, but I think wording of the questions um, is really important. And um, I was fortunate to take a couple courses on qualitative uh, uh, research and specifically like how to do surveys to understand that. But um, I think that's an interesting point and in that we can add into kind of our lessons learned or tips and tricks on how to do it. But yeah, I think the, the art of phrasing questions really matters when it comes to this. Great. Great. Thank you all.